terms of when, when you sat down and wrote The Selfish Gene, there are certain names that pop up in, in the book quite a lot in terms of, I would have imagined, your, your influences. People like uh, Peter Medawar. Um, were you thinking about other people's work? We, we, did you notice that influence when you first sat down to write The Selfish Gene? I think you can't help being influenced by writers that you admire. And Peter Medawar, you mentioned him. Um, I, well, he was, his style was arrogant. He had good reason to be arrogant. I don't have good reason to be arrogant. And so to imitate him would be, would be a, a mistake. But there's something about his, his style, his sort of patrician wit, which um, I think you can't help rubbing off. I don't know whether you find the same, but I find with some of Peter Meadows' phrase-making that I want to kind of rush out into the street and show somebody and say, look at this. And, and um, I, I guess that's bound to rub off a bit. And also, one of my favorite influences you mentioned is because this is an influence that I've heard from other scientists as well. I was saying to you beforehand, Jane Goodall as well, Dr. Doolittle, that oh. when you were a child, is, is that, and it seems interesting because with quite a few scientists I've spoken to, there are children's books which deal with wonderful ideas of communication and his very specifically of talking to animals that actually does seem to have had effect in the way that they interact with ideas of evolutionary biology. Yes, I, I have named Dr. Doolittle as an influence in my life, not so much actually about the talking to animals as being good to animals, as being, um, I think I, first of all, grasped, before the word speciesism had been coined, uh, Dr. Doolittle was forever preaching against speciesism, and I think that certainly rubbed off on me. And I, I want to just talk, we'll, we'll also get into flights of fancy here. You, there's a, a, a beautiful piece you wrote about the ascent of man, which again, I think, was, was hugely influential on a very large number of people. And your piece about Jacob Bronowski seems to, the very important part of, of something which seems to get lost, which feels we still have the two cultures. There are still these battles between art and science, even though so many scientists I know are trying to embrace the arts. And one of those things seems to be an understanding of imagination. Because Jacob Bronowski spent, you know, many of his lectures are about saying, science is about imagination. It's not about counting. It's not about going, I finished counting that thing and now I've got an equation. It's about daydreaming. It's about going into different places. And I, I, I think, you know, quite a lot of your work as well deals with the importance of that imagination. I guess there may be people here too young to have seen uh, the Bronowski, um, the famous series of, um, the Ascent of Man, which was commissioned by David Attenborough. When David Attenborough was head of BBC Two, uh, he commissioned Bronowski to do science, and he commissioned um, Clark um, uh, to do uh, art at, at, at the same time. But they both, were, I think, were 11 part, or 13 part series, really long series. And there was time for these two wonderful explainers to, um, to really let themselves go. And Bronowski had a lovely style. He was, was a sort of understated style, um, but it was immensely effective. And um, his hand gestures were, were part of it. I don't know if he ad-libbed. It looked as though he was ad-libbing. I, I suppose it must have been scripted, but um, it was so well delivered that you would never have known that it was scripted. His visit to, I forget which of the uh, concentration camps it was, probably Auschwitz, I think, and the way he, as a Jew, the way he understated the horror of it, it was so moving, uh, rather than doing a sort of rant. It was wonderful. And when um, it came to... Uh, reprinting a new edition of the book of those famous lectures, I felt extremely honored to be asked by Bronowski's daughter to do the foreword to it. And so I took a lot of trouble over, over that. But it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful series. Of, I think you can still get it, um, probably on either Netflix or one of those maybe um, BBC iPlayer. It's, it is a wonderful thing to spend several evenings listening to this, this extremely good explainer and this 
this poet of science, uh, mm. talking about about science and in, in, in a poetic way. I think you're, in that moment, you say, when he's in Auschwitz, and it's an incredible episode because it begins with discussions about quantum mechanics, and then through that journey of discovery of the nature of probability, if you've never seen it, it's on YouTube, you can see it. It's one of the most, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about, because as far as I know, he, he didn't script it. He, had a, he would collate a load of ideas in his head. You know that wonderful moment where he holds the skull of Lucy, I think? Yes. And he, just, he had lots of ideas in his head, and then the camera, they would go, right, now we're turning, action, and then it would just come together in that moment. And I think that's what gives it... Yeah. And the same moment, that horrifying moment, where he talks about, you know, it was not science that committed those atrocities, it was ideology. It was a belief in utter certainty. And if you've never seen... He, he, no, no one knew he was going to do that. He walked into that pool of ashes. That's holds right, up pool that of ashes, yes. Of, 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 of mud. And, I, and yes. I think that communication is... And it seems to be, a, I mean, still a, a battle to get that communication a, across, to get that idea. You know, you talk in the book about the fact that it's still... John Humphreys on Today programme, I know he's not right anymore, but he would always... When it got to science, it would be kind of, here come the boffins. I, I don't understand any of... Whatever this old kind of nuts thing is, there's yeah. this whole mockery of, like, a, a, as if a scientist like yourself has, has a kind of a different kind of brain, There's a strange, eccentric yeah. brain yeah. that is somehow evidence-based. Yes. I found when I, I, I was interviewed by John Humphreys occasionally, and I found that I was terrified because he had this reputation for being, for being fierce, and he, and he was fierce to politicians. Um, but he was really rather nice, I think, to, to me, and probably is to scientists generally. As you say, it's, it's a bit, bit of a joke, but nevertheless, um, it's fun. Do you, do you feel we are getting places now in terms of... Because I, I sometimes wonder, I think maybe it's just because of the echo chambers that I'm in, where I see so many people who wish to engage with science, and yet I still feel that there is that, that sense of, of, of mockery and, and that sense of that it's fine to go, oh, I don't do maths, oh, I don't really understand physics. Oh, that, well, that, that. That's a socially acceptable thing. Yes, I mean, you can't, you, if, if you said that you thought that, that Byron wrote the Odyssey or something, um, you, you couldn't get away with that in cultivated society, but to say that you that you can't do, do any can't do maths or don't know any science that's that's okay. That 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 is true. I think I wrote about that in an earlier book. I don't think that's probably not in this one. You have a little bit. I think Bernard Levin pops up. That's right, in Bernard this, Levin. In this book. Bernard Levin wrote something about quarks, and he said. The quarks are coming, the quarks are coming. Can you eat quarks? Can you spread them on, the, on your bed when you're cold at night? And, and then some rather magnificent um, physicist wrote back and said, I calculate that Mr. Levin eats God knows how many gazillion quarks every day. <laughs> what for you has been that? I mean, because something like you know, quantum mechanics, uh, some of the, the, the ideas of, of, of cosmology that have, have, have come to light in the last 20 years, some of them are very counter instinctual. But what have been the most difficult ideas that you've faced, those ones where you think, now, this one is... Well, is... not in my own field. I mean, I, 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 of, of course, as a biologist, I don't understand quantum physics. I'm not proud of it. And I do my best, and I, and I talk to physicists whenever I can and try to understand. And I... I get some of the t time that, that I think even they don't really understand it. And, and um, <laughs> well, I, it, they almost definitely say that. I think it was, was it Feynman, uh, among many people who said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Um, and Feynman also said, shut up and calculate. He said, don't, don't, bother, don't bother to try to understand it, just do the sums. And that's what they do. They, they can do the sums, they can do the mathematics, they can deduce mathematically what follows from this weird, incomprehensible theory. And it doesn't matter how weird or incomprehensible it may be, if you do the maths, if you, do, if you shut up and calculate, and actually deduce predictions from it, and then experimentally test the predictions, they come out accurate to so many decimal places that it's equivalent to predicting the width of North America to the width of one human hair. 
So it's got to be true in some sense. And yet nobody understands exactly what it is that's true. Um, because, they, because it's so hard to, for the human mind to grasp. And as an evolutionist, well, I agree with Steve Pinker that our brains were never meant to understand aspects of physics. It's an amazing, in a way, that brains which were designed by natural selection to hunt and gather on the African savanna and never had to deal with anything smaller than a beetle and anything faster than a cheetah, that nevertheless many physicists can understand or go a long way to understanding. Why should we expect that brains that were never designed to understand these things would do so? And it's one of the mysteries, I think one of the mysteries of biology is why it is that this brain of ours can overreach itself and go so far beyond what natural selection ever designed it to do. I think that's a, a wonder of the human species, what makes me proud to be human. It is, a, I mean, it's a, it, that, that always worries me, that old thing about, you know, anyone who says they understand quantum theory doesn't understand quantum theory. Because for someone like me, it gives me a brief moment of victory. Because I think, oh, I don't understand quantum theory either. And then I realise that I don't understand it to a very different level that Jim Al-Khalili doesn't understand it. That's the kind of, uh, yes. But, but that's, I mean, that seems to be part of the excitement, which, again, many of the people you write about uh, in Books Do Furnish Your Life, which is that excitement of the uncertain. And this seems to be, again, part of the battle in science communication. I think sometimes, we're, and we've seen this a lot in the last two years during the pandemic, oh, scientists said this now, but before they said that, not realising that, of course, science is a perpetual journey. And as the evidence improves, as the technology to investigate improves, then our ideas change. But this, it still seems to me to be one of the major battles of saying that science is never 100% certain. Well, that's true, of course, yes. The other thing, I suppose, is, is when people complain that Scientists say so and so is good for you. I don't, I don't know, wine, red, red, red wine is good for the heart. And then next week somebody says it's bad for the heart. Well, those are not actually contradictory because you could have a, a U shaped curve, and if you have a certain amount of something on the upper part of the curve, it's good for you. And then you go over the top and it becomes bad for you. And that's perfectly reasonable. The two are perfectly compatible with each other, they're not contradictory, but the way it's reported, in the papers, it sounds as though it is contradictory. Now, I think the third bottle is the one that is bad for you, isn't it, as far as I remember the... But, but that, that to me seems what, that why it is so important, as, as you say many times, you know, to engage with these ideas. And also I wonder how, much, how you feel about the fact that sometimes, for, again, non-scientists like me, I can read a book and not necessarily understand, like Brief History of Time. So many you know, people go, oh, who read that, oh, that book? You know, everyone bought it, no one read it. I've read it three times. So have I. I still don't understand a no, lot of me, it, me, but me each too. time I get another little bit, yes. and there's another little clue, another little... Ch and that seems to me to be one of the important things in science communication, is not to say, <laughs> here are the answers, but to say, the sky is a little different today, and here are some new questions you can ask. Yeah, I agree. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's the best book out for that subject, and I think that um, it's, it's partly the sort of knowing how, by what an amazing man Stephen Hawking was, and therefore uh, you, you, you want to read it. But um, Peter Atkins on the same kind of subject is, is, is much better and is really poetic, I mean, one of the most poetic writers I, I know. P Peter Atkins, The Creation, or Creation Revisited, is, is a wonderful, you don't necessarily understand it, but you get that feeling of, as it washes through you, you kind of get something, and then you read it again, and it's something, you, get, you get something more, exactly as you said. But at the same time, you're reading these, these beautifully turned phrases um, of, of, of scientific prose poetry. Peter Atkins. Oh, Peter Atkins. Because I, I have that lovely thing where the first time I read it, sometimes I don't understand it at all. The second time, I understand it while I'm reading it. Then I closed the book and realised I didn't understand it yeah. at all. But I enjoyed the time where I believed yeah. I was understanding it. And then hopefully by the third time... And again, that, that's what I, I, I adore about it, is it keeps building, it keeps giving. It's... And the real test is, do you understand it well enough to, to explain it to somebody else? And that's far more difficult. And I find that because I'm, I'm not very bright and it takes me a while to understand something, 
then I'm much better at explaining it to other people because I've had to work so hard at, at understanding it myself. Do you have any... I mean, in terms of explaining ideas, are there certain ideas where your delight... It's like sharing, it, it's like sharing a beautiful piece of art or sharing a beautiful piece of music. There are certain things that to share an idea and see people's face light up as they start. There are so many. What are your, what are your... There are so, so many. I mean, um, a, a lifetime as an Oxford tutor where, where, where I, I've had to discuss, mind you, not so much explaining there as trying to draw it out of other people, but, but yes, I mean, um, oh, I... I all my books, really. If there's any part of my book you enjoy, it's because I roll my sleeves up and say, right, I'm really going to enjoy explaining this, and, and I love it. Is there an idea that you've really felt in the act of writing that you've, you, you've fallen back in? Not that you've fallen out of love with them, but one in particular where you, you, you feel now to hear people also because now people can communicate with you in so many different ways. And that sense that a book may well have changed someone, a chapter may have changed someone, even a sentence might have changed someone. Yes, um, the last chapter of Climbing Mount Improbable is about figs and fig wasps. And if you ask me to explain it now, I will absolutely refuse because it's the most complicated thing I've ever understood, I think. It's an incredibly complicated relationship between figs and their pollinators, which are tiny little wasps, uh, which, by the way, every time you eat a fig, you're eating wasps, you know that. Um, and um, the story is so involved and so complicated, and it really shows what an amazingly complicated thing natural selection is, how it can achieve this amazingly complicated relationship between a plant and an animal. But don't ask me to explain it. Uh, we'll start taking questions at 8 o'clock. <laughs> um, I... I